You're watching World Insight coming to you live from Beijing. So to come on the program. U.S. retail giant makes a big splash on the opening day of its first China store. Despite trade tensions between the two countries, we'll get to you about this story and what's really behind the story. What does it really tell us? Welcome back. You're still watching World Insight on Tianwei. Huge crowds of customers have forced American wholesaler Costco to close its door just five hours after opening its first physical store in China. The U.S. retail giant is diving into the thorny area of food retail in China, despite U.S. President Donald Trump's threat to try to force American companies out of China. So, with such a busy first day, can Costco keep this beginner's luck? Alive. Costco's first physical store in China opened its door at in Shanghai's Minhang district. Thousands of Chinese consumers lined up to enter this American membership warehouse retailer. This supermarket is so big, and many say the prices are very cheap, so I got a membership card. Costco offers a wide range of products, from food and clothing to appliances and houseware. However, it arrives at a time when some international retail giants, including Amazon and Carrefour, are retreating from the Chinese market due to strong competition from local retailers. This U.S.-China trade war indeed worries us. If the prices are getting higher, we may buy fewer American imported goods. With the growing number of Chinese middle-class families, foreign supermarkets and retailers, including Costco and Walmart, are battling to win over China's high-end consumers. But experts say Costco faces a very different market in China, where most city dwellers prefer shopping more frequently and haven't embraced bulk shopping habits. If the service here is good, I will be willing to come here regardless of the prices. China says it always welcomes foreign companies and investors, but the fortunes of these overseas retailers in China will largely depend on their strategies in adapting to local consumer preferences. So joining us to talk about the robust opening of the first Costco in China, what does it really tell us? Let's loop in our panelists in Hong Kong. We have Robert Cap, the director of The Economist the Corporate Network. In Brussels, we invited Peter Chase, senior fellow of the German Marshall Fund of the United States. And in Beijing, last but not least, Liu Baocheng, dean of the Center for International Business Ethics from the University of International Business and economics. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Professor Liu, were you there with you. hundreds of thousands of probably customers in Shanghai, first day of Costco? What do you make of it? Well, you see that I'm, I do not have any bruise or fracture, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> therefore I didn't really join the stamp stampede. But I do, I do have a very favorable uh, impression over Costco because I lived in the United States for a number of years. Right. And uh, they are our favorite, particularly over the weekend. We buy uh, a lot of stuff to fill the trunk that can last for months. So, uh, well, they do not really have a you know, very cater service, but uh, it's uh, everything almost uh, you need is really available over well, there, and also the price is really uh, competitive, and so, uh, okay. you know, it is something impressive. You sound like a salesman for Costco, but anyway, uh, Pro <laughs> Professor Liu is meandering over the memories of a wholesale <laughs> that life uh, in, sh in the United States when he was there. Let's go to you, uh, Mr. Cap, about it. What does it really show? First of all, about the purchasing power, I guess, of the Chinese public. Well, I would say it shows not only the purchasing power, but kind of a purchasing sophistication. You know, the Costco model is, although your uh, previous package talked about uh, a wide variety, actually it's not so much wide in uh, absolute selection. It's, it's a variety of basic items but then they actually narrow your selection. That's how they keep their costs low. So it, it, it's just a whole new approach. It's shopping in a warehouse. It's not like a yeah. typical shopping experience at all. 
And I think what's impressive is that the Chinese consumers can uh, adjust, adjust to that here in China when they're used to a different type of shopping experience. It shows they're still very open-minded to try new things. Obviously, they like a great deal, and it's uh, indeed positive, as you've been mentioning, Tinwei, about uh, the receptiveness to an American offering. Mm. Mr. Chase, you know, wholesale is nothing new, not even in China, of course, uh, you know, this country have had this, uh, embraced this idea for a long time, uh, including with some of the other retailers, uh, wholesale clubs. Uh, but Mr. Chase, you know, when you look at the story, like a real story on the ground, it sounds sarcastic even about its comparison with the trade negotiations going on between the two governments. It seems that the, the public is certainly uh, chasing what they consider as important while the two governments are in are locked in a way in a trade war quote unquote well that's true but i think that that's often the case that there's often a big big disconnect between what governments do and what people do and what people think about and what they feel what they're interested in um, i think that you know american American consumers continue to buy a lot of Chinese products, China, products made in China. And I think that in this case, in the case of Costco, Costco is bringing, as Mr. Kapp was just saying, a different approach to retailing mm. that may or may not work in China. And people are willing to try it out. And I think that that's a good thing. Mm. Now, of course, uh, Professor Liu, but, it's not just the trade mm. war that people have in mind, but, you know, when it makes sense, when the prices make sense, the Chinese going to jump on it. Uh, Professor Liu, that's, of course, uh, we all know the nature of Chinese consumers. Uh, meanwhile, uh, some of the Chinese families are having huge numbers of, uh, uh, you know, members in, in the family. So having something in large proportion is not a bad idea, to, according to them. But Professor Liu, what does it really say about the, you know, the current stage of Chinese purchasing culture even. Uh, what is the taste hmm. of the Chinese consumers? You see them in the high street of, you know, some of the most well-known metropolitan cities purchasing uh, very expensive luxury products. You also see them now very active on the wholesale market. What exactly is the way to describe the Chinese consumers, Professor Liu? Yes, uh, well, uh, to respond to the previous question, they gave me a picture that when parents are, are pointing fingers to each other across the table and kids are beginning to play together <laughs> under the table. <laughs> so, uh, well, for Chinese consumers, you know, the uh, uh, Chinese consume, uh, consumption pattern is uh, very much friendly to yeah. all, towards globalization and they are selective but in the meantime they are also very receptive to any innovative products and innovative way of retailing and uh, it is really supported by the rising power and also the confidence that uh, yeah. they are able to live a better life tomorrow by having a better income so that's something that sets in for the uh, Chinese uh, consumers and right. uh, also another very important thing that uh, uh, people share information uh, on a very close mm. basis so you, you go into groups not only families you know friends together so this is something that yeah. is very different as uh, what I observe either in Europe or uh, North America. Mr. Kapp of course you've been living in China for quite a couple of years what do you find out about, you know, the nature of Chinese consumers' mentality? Well, I think picking up on some of the points Bao Cheng was making, I think one way to understand the seeming contradiction that you have on the one hand very high-end consumption and on the other hand this, this uh, crazed uh, descending on, on the first uh, large-scale warehouse uh, retail offering is that the Chinese consumer is now uh, able to respond to a wider variety. They've become more discerning. Uh, before, like when I think of uh, my, my years spent in Beijing, uh, a, over a decade ago, you had to have a brand, right? So particularly female shoppers, everyone had to have an LV bag. And that's one of the things that fueled knockoffs, actually copies, because anything that showed LV on it was considered cool. They weren't necessarily concerned about the quality. I would say it's very different today. Uh, Chinese are not so much conspicuous consumers. They will be if they want to be, but they can also feel very comfortable shopping for a discount and, and feeling good about saving money. That shows a kind of maturity in the retail marketplace. Mm. When Costco 
is having such a grand open day, uh, Mr. Chase. Many would wonder, what about the other wholesalers around the world? When they look at the Chinese uh, market, it could be so hot. I'm sure a lot of them are thinking, hmm, why don't we move over there as well, Mr. Chase? Will American companies, as a result, face much more competition in the future, particularly with the uncertainty of the trade war? Well, American companies, I think, I, the things, things that I've been reading and mm. uh, including surveys of American companies who are in uh, China, yes, the trade war does affect them, and they're, they're very aware that that you know a lot of Chinese the Chinese government and the, the a lot of Chinese people look at American companies and say you have a president who's en entering into a trade war with us and um, maybe I don't want to buy your products mm -hmm. I think that there is some of that but I think that there is well Costco is different and uh, Mr. Cap mentioned this in his in his first remark in the sense that it may not be so much that Chinese consumers' habits are changing, but that the offering available to Chinese consumers are changing. And then that's what Costco brings. It's mm. very counterintuitive as a business strategy for a company to have a very, a relatively small line of products, or what they do is they have one or two of very good quality but basic price. And I think that rather than yeah. just buy the high end, there's maybe there's been a little bit of a gap in China between very high-end things and things that are, are lower end. Mm. And what Costco is trying to do is to fill that gap. Um, that's, that would be, I think, any other retailer that wanted to follow it or had to look, would have to look at the experiences that other companies have had mm -hmm. and look at Costco's own model and decide, you know, am I going to be able to replicate what may or may not be a success for Costco? Right. The first, first day was over too successful, so to speak, <laughs> um, but hopefully things, hopefully things will settle down yeah. and people will just start going there normally and using it the way it's meant to be used. Mm. Where Costco gets a lot of money is impulse, impulse buying yeah. because you wander through the entire store and then you just see you know, this big roll of, I don't know, paper towels and all of a sudden you decide you need paper towels or an 80-inch <laughs> TV. For the rest of the next th two to three years, yes, it's going to be the same to paper towels. Um, no offense, Costco, but Professor Liu, um, <laughs> you know, that really gives some kinds of further thinking to other companies who try to do resale in China, that retail in China, because the taste of consumers have changed. And Chinese consumers are not going to blindly just buy the so-called luxurious brands or have the brands as if they are sacred. But rather, what they consider, whether it's impulse or not, uh, important or need to have. So how is this going to change also a rethinking about the realities of the Chinese market and how to fill if there are any gaps, Professor? Well. Uh Definitely, the, uh, there's rising uh, purchase power, particularly among the middle class and uh, particularly those uh, uh, metropolitan people. And uh, they are also getting uh, a lot more sophisticated. And then, you know, uh, Costco, you know, is really there to fill the gap with uh, reliability and uh, less choice, but uh, is more focused. And uh, then, you know, the uh, how they can really provide the type of uh, uh, shopping experience where they are not really uh, embarrassed mm -hmm. or bothered by so many people pastoring, you know, what do you buy this or what okay. do you buy that? So that gives people quite uh, much of a ease. Right. So uh, this type of, you know, shopping experience can also uh, be really uh, be able to bring down some people from uh, the, uh, their reliance on the online shopping. You which know, you sound no so polite uh, in, in the way you just explained and also very diplomatic, I have to say, Professor Liu. Mr. Cap, you know, one of the things what Costco did during the first day of its grand opening is to sell Mao Tai, which is one of the most expensive heart liquor in China, in a very reasonable and much lower price than you see elsewhere in the other stores. And therefore, people just lined up uh, for hours in order to get the inexpensive Mao Tai. Mm. So you got the bait over there. 
And besides the bait, you got a lot of real stuff as the store usually offer. So an interesting local colorful uh, product combined with the usual yeah. line that Costco offer. That's going to be an interesting mix, isn't it, Mr. Cap? Yeah, I think you're absolutely correct, Tinway. In fact, it's perhaps best to consider this. I know, I know it's interesting to compare with the uh, U.S.-China trade war and everything, but in fact, it's not so much, as you point out, with Maotai, a U.S. company selling U.S. products as it is a U.S. company bringing in a U.S. business model and localizing it. Mm. And uh, I, my hat is off to them. I don't know what deal they struck, but they have very low margins, but they have to have some margins. So somehow they were able to cut a deal with Maotai to supply the volume, to offer those prices, and still make some money. But uh, anyway, to, to, to work out, uh, for all their supply arrangements, they have to have special relationships with the brands. Yeah. So they, they accomplished that, obviously, with Maotai and, and I would assume a number of other local brands. And that shows that they're not just bringing in an American concept, they're bringing in an American style of business, but with local content. Mm -hmm. We're seeing some of the photos uh, reflecting the scenes then earlier on the screen. <laughs> what a sight. But for now, I guess we'll have to put that topic to rest a little bit, even though people could be still drunk by the memories of the inexpensive Mao Tai. <laughs> Thank you so much, the three of you. Robert Cap, <laughs> Peter Chase. Celebrating the sale. <laughs> yes, indeed. And Liu Baocheng, cheer to all of you. Thank you so much. And that is all Thank the time we have for today. Thank you. If you'd like to see more, try to find us yeah. World Inside CTTA in your search engine or check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and see in a Weibo. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone on the World Inside team, thanks for watching and tune in again next time for more insights across China and around the world.